Hey guys, welcome to Silicon Valley Girl. Today we're gonna talk about immigration, immigration to the US. I know that a lot of you who are watching this video are either dreaming of coming here or are already here and are trying to adapt to this weird American culture. Today I'm gonna interview Shuram Krishnan. And um, I don't know if you've heard of his name, but you've definitely, well, 80% chance you've heard of a guy who brought Elon Musk to Clubhouse. Okay. Hey, hey Elon. Hey, hey. Hello there. Hello. Hey. Um, oh, we see you. And when he interviewed Elon Musk and Clubhouse, they had around 1 million people who listened live either on YouTube or Twitch. Uh, they restreamed it to different platforms. We're going to talk about how he got his green card, how he was able to get a job in Silicon Valley while still uh, being in India. And uh, we're going to talk about his amazing immigrant journey and how he made it here in the US. This is the second part of our interview. In the first part, we actually talk about being a VC, we talk about the creator economy, we talk about his investing culture. The link will be down below. And right now, let's talk about immigration. Yeah, let's talk about India, because I have, on this channel, I think over 10% followers are from India. Lingua Marina has also a big chunk of Indian audience. Tell me your journey, how right. you came from India to the US, because I guess that's the for a lot of people, that's the ultimate goal, right? To go to get into Silicon Valley in, in India. And uh, it's also very hard uh, from the visa perspective. And mm -hmm. Great question. And uh, thank you, because I haven't had a chance to tell this story before. I grew up in Chennai, which is uh, a city in the south of India. It's one of the, the four large cities. We come from, my both my wife, Aarti, and I come from uh, very, very traditional, typical Indian households. And this is a very Indian term. We are what people, are, we came from what people call like lower middle class, which is, you know, we were comfortable, but, you know, we were not, you know, very economically uh, well off. I think one of the things I was very lucky with was when I was about 18 years old, I convinced my dad to buy me a PC. And it was, a, it was a big deal because it cost, I think, six, at the time, I think it was 60, 70,000 Indian rupees, which was almost like a large part of his yearly paycheck. And when I convinced him, I was like, you know, I'll, you know, I'll study and I'll do all these things. And, you know, I kind of, I wore him down like a lot of typical teenager would. And he bought me a PC. And I, and I didn't even have internet at the time because dial up internet was too expensive. Uh, you would run up the phone bill. And I remember those sounds. Yes, And you would run up the phone bill. And so you didn't have internet, dial up internet, but I had a PC. And what I would do is I would go to all these used bookstores uh, and go buy these coding books, right? Mm -hmm. You know, teach yourself Visual Basic or in programming in C. And every night I would basically teach myself how to write code. Um, and that's how I really got started. I was very self taught. And about a couple of years, I might have told the story before, I actually met Arthi online back mm -hmm. in India because um, in around 2002, one of her friends wanted to build a website. He didn't know anybody who wrote code. So he called upon the two nerdiest people he knew, which is yeah. me and her. <laughs> and he added us in a Yahoo Messenger chat room, which tells you how old we are. Like, mm -hmm. you know, a Yahoo Messenger, I don't think is a thing anymore. And he said, look, can you help me build the site? Uh, we, I don't think we ever got made progress building the site, but we ended up on each other's Yahoo Messenger friend list. Mm -hmm. And we started chatting and we only chatted by Yahoo for a year before we met in person. Actually, when we met in person, we didn't even know how each other looked like. Wow. So, and, yeah, he, so, and then the magic happens. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. so I like to tell people like, you know, my pithy line is we, you know, we met online, but there was no swiping right. But in some ways, like the internet has been so foundational to, you know, our story. Um, and we were in school in like, you know, in India. And I think the big break for me and her is in around 2003, I had written a series of blog posts on Microsoft technology, mm -hmm. which was noticed by Microsoft. And it got noticed. So they, you wrote it on your own blog or? Yeah, on my own blog. Uh, I had like a blog oh, on. Uh, and they noticed it? Yes. Wow. Because at the time, uh, you know, they, uh, Microsoft was holding a conference in India. They, uh, they've been holding conferences in India and they wanted to launch a product meant for students. Mm -hmm. And the idea was there'll be this big shot Microsoft exec who would fly over and you'll have this, some local student come in and they, the local student will do like a five minute demo and be like, ta-da, look, you know, you know uh, thanks to this Microsoft technology, I'm so empowered. Mm -hmm. The challenge was they did not know any Indian students at the time. Somebody, you know, uh, found my blog post and they said, hey, this kid, you know, might be reasonable. Wow. And I think, I think at the time they're like, we're running out of options. And I get a cold email from, you know, Microsoft saying like, hey, you know, first we'll make sure you're not a crazy person. But then, <laughs> you know, we'll have to, you know, have talk to you and fly you over. And um, this was a huge deal for me because at the time I had never been on a plane before, never really been outside of my city, Chennai before. And this happened in a different city in Bangalore. And they flew me 
over. Uh, they put me up in a five-star hotel, which was so fancy, right? What did your parents say? They knew it was a big deal, mm -hmm. but they didn't really understand it because, you know, it was something in the computer. It wasn't real. Yeah. But they knew Microsoft was like, you know, such a huge brand and everyone yeah. knew Bill Gates. And so they were, and, but when Microsoft flew me over, they were like, oh my God, that's crazy because, you know, a plane trip, first ever plane trip, uh, you know, first ever five-star yeah, hotel, so you know, so it, it really impressed them. And, uh, and so this demo went really well. Uh, in fact, this executive I did the demo for is actually one of our closest friends now. He actually became an investor in my wife's company 10 years later. So, so wow. uh, he became like a, he's one of our closest friends and uh, mentors even to this day. And he talked to me and Aarti um, uh, and he said, look, you kids should work at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And we were like, well, we would love to, but you might as well be in a different galaxy because we are here and you don't even recruit at the schools that we uh, study in. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, I'll take care of that. And what he did was he sent kind of an angry email to his recruitment team saying, like, hey, you know, I met these kids and we should find a way to hire them. It turns out that like when you have like a senior exec like send that kind of email, it sets a lot of uh, 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 wheels into motion. So they were like, well, we need to hire these people. We need to interview them. So we got recruited into Microsoft in India, mm -hmm. right? And at one time, I think we were the youngest product managers they ever had. Uh, we were just on 20. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. And we hadn't finished school yet. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because they didn't know what to do with us because we kind of came to this weird executive saying, like, you should yeah. hire these kids. Was, was so we, they should do nobody so we, got, we kind of short circuited the process mm -hmm. and we got hired into Microsoft in um, India. In fact, we hadn't. So, this is a story I was not comfortable telling for years. We actually, we didn't finish college when we actually joined Microsoft. Mm -hmm. and But we needed to get our degree. So, Microsoft actually spoke to our colleges and they said, look, let them work at Microsoft and let count the work as Microsoft as credits oh, so nice. that you yeah. actually that we, get, we get yeah. degree but it took some negotiation right and I think like I think Microsoft kind of sponsored some event to kind of like make them all feel happy uh, it, only like many many years later I feel comfortable but you know we got our degrees so we actually have our degrees now mm -hmm. um, but um, and so we joined Microsoft um, and uh, Microsoft India was amazing so we Arthi and I love that place and this is also when we started dating and we loved that place we would um, we would stay up all night at work, you know, I remember like we used to sleep at office, right? We just like, you know, we just have our like team bags and we'd work all day and night, uh, you know, because we were just kids. We had like, you know, we had no life and we loved Microsoft. And even to this day, you know, I'm so thankful to Microsoft for kind of giving us that opportunity because without that, you know, who knows where our life would have been. So we spent two years there and two years later, we, uh, Microsoft flew us over to here. Did you ask for it or? Kind of, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had, uh, there were some interesting teams which were building work here and, um, um, one of our, my managers had moved here and they were like, hey, you should come work here. Um, and once we figured out the visa process, which uh, I'll uh, get into, they flew us over here, here being uh, Redmond in near Seattle, which is where Microsoft is based out of. And that was a very remarkable experience. So I flew here in May 2007. First trip abroad, right? Yes. Um, and that was crazy. I spoke the language, but I remember being here and I didn't really have a credit card. I didn't really have any money. You're all alone here. And what six year was it? 2000? 2007. Mm -hmm. And six months later, Aarti came on board too. Uh, and she flew over too. And I think that was, their, that was her first international flight. So for all of us, it was such a weird experience. I remember, I don't think I've told the story before. The very first day I wake up in Redmond, I'm at the small motel place that they set up, set up for Microsoft employees until they mm -hmm. find accommodation. And, you know, it's it's a sleepy suburb. Microsoft, the building is right across the street. It's mm -hmm. like 20 feet in front yeah. of me. And there is this, you have to cross the street and you have to get the lights to turn on. And India does not have a concept of pressing a button to get the lights to turn on. Oh. And I'm standing here and I'm like, how do I actually cross the street? Right? And, and I'm waiting and yeah, waiting. I, I waited for like probably 40 minutes and it felt so, oh. like, you know, I, I felt like, okay, here I am, you know, like, you know, I, I have this amazing job. And I'm and, late, right? And, and I can't figure out how to cross like 20 streets. And I was terrified of like, you know, jaywalking. Uh, and uh, there are all these kind of, and Arthi and I, when we came here, we didn't have a car for, I think like probably over a year and a half. And Seattle winters came actually that year got pretty cold um, and we would like walk like a mile and a half in the snow to buy groceries and you know uh, I think pretty much any immigrant you know probably relates to some of these stories but we were like oh, I, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, but I think the thing which we loved was Microsoft itself and being in technology even though I it took me a while to get used to being living here in the US when you saw that Microsoft sign and when you walked into that building or when you switched on your computer you felt at home. Mm -hmm. You were like, okay, I can do this. Like, I know this world, I yeah, can do this. Exactly. But, so I think because all this is why we are so thankful to Microsoft and they always hold a fond place in my heart because they kind of plucked us out of obscurity mm -hmm. and kind of planted us here and kind of gave us all the opportunities which kind of really started our career. So we spent five years at Microsoft 
And we loved that place. I worked on cloud computing. I worked on... Uh, Asia, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I was one of the first PMs they ever had on Azure. I even before it was called Windows Azure. But I think Arthi and I, we always idolize the mythology of Silicon Valley. Yeah. I, like, I like how you watched the Silicon Valley movie on your yes. first date. Oh my gosh, you did your research. Yeah, wow, it's, it's okay. Uh, it's just how do you know this? Pompliano. Wow. Okay, wow. Yeah, that is <laughs> That's, it, you did your research. Okay, that is true. Right? So this is going to sound very interesting, but Arthi and I, you know, I think in some ways, you know, we've always kind of born with the idea of like being here in technology, even when we were random kids in the middle of India. And one of our first dates was we down downloaded a BitTorrented copy of Pat Silicon Valley, hopefully 15 years so nobody gets me into legal trouble now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we would watch it in my tiny room, which had like no furniture. Mm -hmm. And uh, even now, I still remember the opening line of you know, Noah Wiley, who plays Steve Jobs. He'll talk about making a dent in the universe. And in, we were these kind of these wide-eyed, uh, impressionable kids going like, someday we want to be there, right? And that's that's amazing. You made it. When we actually, in Microsoft, when two, three years in, we made our first trip down here, mm -hmm. the first thing we did was, uh, and this was, you know, when Steve Steve Jobs was alive and CEO Apple, was we used to go to the drive road to his house. Right, right. I think everybody does. Everybody that. We went to Zuckerberg's, uh, Zuckerberg's house yes. and uh, Steve Jobs' house to yes. go to uh, drive uh, around. In fact, I think Arthur used to say that, you know, Steve Jobs' security people probably had like a profile on her because uh, you know, she would like run past the house and then we would take a photo in uh, you know the Apple one infinite loop parking lot you know and we would send it to our parents and you know it was so inspirational and we felt like we had made it we felt like oh my gosh we are here we are here at all the famous buildings and it's funny because when I was at Facebook I used to see people now doing that they come to Facebook and they bring their families and I always love that I always because I think when you grow up here you don't really understand that yeah. and I always love that moment right mm -hmm. um, because it's such a special being like you're actually finally physically here but we did that like we would come down we took a photo and like every one of the famous campuses all the guards would be like <laughs> yes all the guards were like you know, I, mean, I think they were used to it and you know but they were like yeah we we definitely did the tour of you know uh, his house here and you know the campuses, but yeah. So, but we always want to come here. Um, and about our immigration process was really tied to uh, Microsoft. We didn't really know how to leave Microsoft for a long time because leaving it would have kind of caused all these issues. But you were you were an L1 visa yes. at Microsoft, and then they applied for a green card for you, or yeah. So, uh, well, this is going to get like very really deep in the immigration process, right? Uh, uh, but we were on L1 visa, but I think. I forget what had happened, but at the time, Microsoft had some layoffs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and because of the layoffs, the, the either the US government or the Washington government had stopped processing uh, the piece of paperwork that you need from the Department of Labor, mm -hmm. right? I think you, you need, I, I, it's been so long now, but I forget. But you needed some approval and they had stopped processing it and said, hey, Microsoft, you need to tell us like what's going on here because you just had these layoffs and there's this huge political conversation happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality was like, Green cards just got stopped for us, right? The whole process got really stopped. And actually, there was a time when we were about to move to Canada because we... With Microsoft or...? With Microsoft. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But eventually, I was like, we were like, we want to build startups and companies. We don't want to like be at Microsoft forever. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll go to Vancouver and, you know, we'll come back and recapture our priority date, right? Which is like, if you're, if you're on a visa process, you know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, but thankfully, um, there's a lawyer at Microsoft who said, hey, you know what, you know, let's maybe try applying for you in a, um, in a different category because I think we think that you really qualify. Uh, he tried it um, and, you know... EB1, right? EB1. Yeah. Uh, and we got through and probably one of the things which is when it comes to like things which impact your life I would say that is top five right um, absolutely uh, again this is one of the things if uh, you know for folks who are watching this uh, if they are in the immigration process they probably understand it but if you're not you may not but I remember the morning when we got the email saying we're approved and we had to go get the actual you're like you start breathing yes and <laughs> definitely it, the amount of relief and I remember uh, we drove down uh, and you just felt on top of the world. The other feeling I really remember is the very first time we flew back home to the US from abroad. You, and you, oh, and you don't have to go through the process of sitting in the room, right? Well, yes, you always had to carry all this paperwork. You always had to carry all this paperwork yeah. where you, know, you kind of, you know, your employee letter and your paycheck and all this. And the very first time we green card we flew through, the, the officer, uh, the CBP officer, you know, stamped the passport and he said, welcome home. Yeah, that's that's the moment for every yes. immigrant. Like when, when he says, welcome home. He says, welcome home. home, which I think is a script. And you, I, I'm sure it's kind of a script, but uh, Arthi and I, it was such an emotional moment. And I think that was, this was in, um, I, th I think like 2012. We got our citizenship uh, five years later. Oh, by the way, again, 
one of the most emotional, uh, I, I think along with our wedding and the birth of our daughter, I think becoming a US citizen is uh, really up there. And there was a judge who does the ceremony um, at this theater in Oakland. He was funny and it was amazing. And you get to do the whole like, you know, you, you, the national anthem, but as a citizen. But the most remarkable moment was, um, you know, he said, you know, all of you folk, you know, who are so used to carrying these papers when you travel, you don't have to do that. If you ever get into any trouble or if somebody asks you, just walk up and say, I'm an American citizen. And I swear that whole crowd just went nuts. Wow. Right? It went nuts. And we were very lucky. We we're so thankful to this country for all the opportunities it's given us. We we're very, very lucky. And, you know, I think for folks watching this, if you're going through the process, you know, I have such huge empathy for you. Uh, if you made it through the process, you understand how, you know, what I'm talking about in terms of the emotional field. But yeah, anyway, sorry, I got sidetracked, but that was such a huge part of our no, lives. No, it's, it's great. And uh, what would be your advice to people in India? Because I it seems like you got really lucky, but that there's also a lot of work behind it. You started your blog, you learned how to code. What would be your advice to, to people in India who want to get into Silicon Valley? Good question. So the first response I would have is, I don't know whether it's even necessary anymore to get into Silicon Valley if you're in India. Like 15 years ago when I got here, you know, that was not the case. The Indian startup ecosystem at the time was pretty non-existent. Mm -hmm. There were almost no companies there, almost no venture funding there. But India right now is just exploding with startup activity. The week that we're shooting this, we have Zomato, which is just going public. Mm -hmm. There are all these other startups uh, which are going to go public soon. Uh, uh, you know, there are like, dozens of Indian, you know, companies at billion plus dollar valuations, huge consumer brands, uh, you know, Paytm, Swiggy, Cred, Zomato, there's so many, there's such amazing activity that first of all, I think if you're in India, you have this great opportunity at home. And I think, you know, that's been so exciting for me to see, which is uh, every time I go back home, it's just meeting the amazing local ecosystem and not just founders, right? You meet angels and you meet uh, full-fledged VC firms and you meet people who have made some money and they're trying to give back to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. If you do want to come here, uh, I think, you know, the first thing I would say, the internet is your friend. My tips and tricks for everybody are always the same. You know, create and do work in public. Um, you know, if you want to write, write on Twitter. If you want to create videos, you know, this start is a vlog. St start a vlog. Uh, you know, there's so many amazing Indian uh, YouTubers and streamers these days. It's so amazing to see. Uh, if you if you write code, you know, put up your work on GitHub mm -hmm. because the world is so flat now and people really want talent. So showcase your work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, by the way, uh, you know, even now, you know, every two, three days, I will go seek out somebody on Twitter, you know, who I never met before. I don't really care which part of the world from them. I'll kind of send them a DM or send them an email saying, hey, I really like your work. Mm -hmm. So I would say, the first thing I would say is just publish, start publishing your work online. And I think this applies to everyone uh, yes. worldwide. Yes, actually that's true. I think that's part of it, which is, it doesn't really matter which, uh, where you are in the world. Yeah. Um, the internet is your friend. Uh, because you can just, a, a smart blog post or a well done video or a great piece of code can come from anybody and nobody really cares where you live. Mm -hmm. Because you know the internet seeks out amazing talent. So my first advice to pretty much anybody you know in any country is always like find a way to put your work online. So that's number one. The number two is in some ways COVID has been a great accelerant um, because before COVID, uh, companies I think didn't really truly embrace remote work mm -hmm. or people working remotely. But these days, uh, you know, there are so many interesting companies uh, which have fully distributed teams. So, and you can just work out of anywhere in the world. So you can, you can just be on Zoom, you hold events through Hopin, you are on Slack, and it doesn't really matter where you are. So in some ways, like COVID is, is an accelerant. So I think, so you now have opportunities where you can now participate in a company or participate in a crypto project in ways that you could just never do before. Start with putting up your work online mm -hmm. and amazing people will find you. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. A uh, couple more questions around your being an immigrant. Mm -hmm. uh, first, um, accent. Have you ever thought of like switching to American? Have you ever tried? Because that was a problem. That it's still like, I'm still working on it. Have you ever thought that that might be a barrier? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, um, uh, yes, for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's funny. Uh, if for folks listening in India, they probably think I have a very, I have a very American accent. Uh, oh. Because my accent has started switching over the years. Uh, I don't know why. I think a lot of Indians when they come here, their accent starts to uh, slow, of slowly course, you switch. Just, yeah, you, you, you just start absorbing it. Yeah. it. 
I would say, so I have a couple of problems. One is I speak really fast, as is probably obvious to people. Uh, I, I actually like it. I like the speed. Uh, so <laughs> it's loud. It's great. Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you. It, it, it's, it's not quite taste for some people. Um, and the second part of it, I have an accent. So in my when I first came here, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to even understand what I was saying. Because mm, um, it was so strong, right? It, it was it? strong and I was speaking fast. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't totally understand what I was saying. So uh, I remember being like frustrated at times because it was very clear that, you know, um, I wasn't getting across mm -hmm. and nobody would point it out. But you could tell, yeah. like you could tell yeah. because their eyes were not like, you know, they were glazing over. Um, and I was very self-conscious for a long time because when I was in India, uh, I used to do a lot of public speaking. Um, I used to do a lot of stuff on stage. I used to do a lot of conferences. And um, for a while, I just didn't have a lot of confidence doing that. But what I think really helped me is inside Microsoft, I started doing a lot of speaking events. I did this event, which was, and I was maybe 23, 24. And this is big Microsoft event where you present to all these executives. And I presented about Windows Azure. It's a big deal. And you uh, volunteered to do that? Or they uh, I got been... picked. I was very lucky because they kind of picked somebody young as kind of like a, a way to kind of like say, hey, here's your you know chance to you know present your work to you know Balmer and you know all these execs uh, in this internal event. And I remember going up and I, you know, I told this joke and everyone laughed. It, it, take my word and for it. Like, I was, yes. uh, <laughs> and I was like, okay, I can do this. And after that, I started doing more public speaking. And honestly, it just became something over time where you just become comfortable with. And also your accent changes and uh, people have been so kind and gracious. One of the I think, amazing things about Silicon Valley is like, this place is so friendly to immigrants. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, like a, well, pretty much every team I've worked in has been a lot of folks from Asia, from India, from China, uh, from Latin America, from Russia, from Ukraine. And so you get so many immigrants that you work with. So people are really, really friendly here. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, and this is, not a story I've said before. Early last year, for months, I almost I refused to be on Clubhouse because I hated the sound of my voice. Oh, right, and but that's but that's everyone, right? Yes, I was. <laughs> I was. I used to cringe. I was like, I, I don't like the way I sound. Uh, you know, I'm 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 I'm, I, I, I'm not projecting the right tone. I hated the sound of my voice, so I would refuse to speak. People would invite me to Clubhouse, and I would just be there, but I would refuse to speak. And it was actually Arthi who pushed me to say like, you should actually start doing this, right? And 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 I think. You know this too. The only way to get comfortable with something is just do it a bunch of times. And once I started doing clubbers a bunch of times, and I started getting some positive feedback, I, was like, I can actually do this. So my next thing. I like your approach. Uh, you just go fast your fears. Well, thank you. But, but my now current fear is actually being on video. And uh, you know, uh, I, so in some ways, like you're really inspiring because for so many years I was so self-conscious about being on video. I think a lot of us are. I was like, you know, I don't really look right. You know, you know, am I coming across the proper way? But now I'm like, I'm trying to get over it. And I think it, the secret to all these things, you just, if you do it enough times yeah. and you learn from it, you get better. You so get I don't know if this answered your question, but I just got comfortable over a long period no, of time. No, it does. It's, it's great. Yeah, you just overcome your fear and do things that you wouldn't even think or, about. Or you get really good at hiding it and managing it. Well, yeah. <laughs> and and the second question regarding American culture, because um, there are so many things that are different. For example, as a Russian, the first time I came here, I was surprised that you have a conversation with a person, then you email them and they never reply. Ghosting. That, that's the concept I learned here, because in Russia it doesn't happen. Were there any things like that that you were surprised about uh, in America? Good Except for the, the button. Oh, uh, <laughs> good question. Happened. I would say... So uh, the first thing is in India, you know, the the lines between work and family are much blurry. And this is, by the way, me speaking from 2007. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, we everyone knew everyone each other, and we were much closer. It was kind of a family. It kind of blurred mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Uh, if you're from India, you understand. You kind of you probably understand this. And when I came to Microsoft, there was such a you know, you worked with somebody and then you went home. And you were not like, and they were not the same sort of people you socially hung out with. Um, and that was kind of like a bit of a change. And it was also because I think the people we worked at Microsoft was much bit older than we were. So we didn't have a social circle uh, we could uh, plug into. That was a change uh, for us. I think the other part of it is, is like, you know, just the, uh, the social uh, dynamics. Like, for example, uh, I remember when you first came to Seattle, uh, you know, somebody on the road would strike up a conversation with you, which would not happen in, you know, back home in India. Like, you just wouldn't speak to a stranger on the street. Mm -hmm. But in Redmond, it was very common to speak to a stranger on the street. Well, hey, how are you doing? Uh, and what's your day like? Yeah, good. Nice sweater. Uh, <laughs> you get it? Yeah. And yeah. that took some um, uh, getting used to. I would say the thing which took me a while to get used to was like in uh, corporate culture in the US, 
there is not a lot of deference to authority. So there is this kind of, uh, you know, there is this term called the power gap, uh, which is basically in different cultures, how much deference to authority do you have? And Eastern cultures, you know, uh, India, Japan, usually have much more deference to authority. Like if, for example, if you have somebody who's senior in a room, you know, you are very respectful to them, you're deferential to them, you know, you don't want to say no often. Um, and uh, uh, there's a great book on this, which about different cultures. And when you came to the US, it was actually, in Microsoft, it was actually expected that you actually talk back. Like if, you know, the CEO asked you a question, mm -hmm. you know, if you felt no, you yeah, spoke yeah. your mind. Yeah. Uh, and that was very, un that took me a while to get used to. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you met Bill Gates, you called him Bill and not like, you know, Mr. Gates. Yeah, I mean, like, it, 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 so that's the whole thing. It was much more common to meet the, you know, um, meet the leaders of these companies. And it took a while for me to get used to, mm -hmm. uh, because in the culture I grew up in, you often said, you didn't want to say no because mm -hmm. if you did, if you said no, it was often seen as like disappointing somebody. Mm -hmm. But here, if you if if you said yes, even though you meant no, people want to take you at your word, and uh, so you kind of have to. I kind of had to learn to communicate with much more clarity mm -hmm. and with much less su cultural subtext. So there's a great book That's called yeah. there's a great book called. Uh, I think it's called the culture code, which talks about different cultures. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, it talks about how like German culture has the least subtext. And, you know, the idea is like you actually communicate, you have to be super clear about what you say. And I think American culture is somewhat similar, whereas East, uh, Eastern cultures are usually there's much more subtext. So it's really fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, you for watching this up to the very end. If you're not yet subscribed, the red button is down below and like this video if you liked it. And by the way, if you're watching from India, let me know where you're watching from. Yes. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.